It's not the way anyone wanted to see it happen. But Victor Scott II will be the Cardinals center fielder on opening day. We'll talk about the news coming up on b Shave Daily. What's going on, everyone? And welcome in to this edition of b Shave Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It is Tuesday, March 26, 2024. We are two days away from Cardinals opening day in Los Angeles, taking on the Dodgers. The season is nearly upon us. The content will be hot and heavy. And it starts today with the news of Victor Scott II making the opening day roster after all. And according to John Mosellock, reports from Arizona transferring his information. We'll credit who said it. I saw John Denton, Derek Gould, Kitty Wu all putting it out there. Victor Scott II will be on the opening day roster for the Cardinals and in center field on Thursday in Los Angeles to start the season. This is news that would have seemed pretty surprising as of the weekend when the Cardinals optioned, or rather, they didn't option him. They sent him to the minors camp, and the distinction there is he's not on the 40-man. So anybody that's on the 40-man roster that gets sent out, they're optioned to Memphis or wherever they're heading, whereas they don't need to make that determination with the other players just yet. But he was sent to minors camp. It seemed he was destined to start in AAA to begin the year. And then on Monday, we had the collision between Jordan Walker and Dylan Carlson in right center field out in, I think they're playing in Mesa, Cubs Cardinals out in Arizona before the regular season kicks off on Thursday. I believe today, Tuesday is the last of those two games. Big collision in right center field between Carlson and Walker. Here's my take on the collision, first of all. They're both going for a ball that neither of them are able to get to, and so that's probably why you don't see either call off the other. I saw quotes after the game from Jordan Walker saying he didn't hear Carlson call him off, and he's always you know, been told that if you're not called off by the center fielder, keep going. And that is understandable, but also, man, it's a spring training game. It is not worth losing your center fielder to injury, your backup center fielder at this point, because your starting center fielder is also hurt. And oh yeah, your starting left fielder is also hurt. So it's a frustrating play to see. And one that, you know what? Like it's hard to place blame. A more veteran right fielder probably figures out a way to duck out earlier from that. But also that's the pinnacle of the type of play that you see guys get hurt on because it truly was a ball dead between the two of them. Neither of them could quite get to it, so neither felt comfortable to say, I got it, I got it, calling off the other guy. And you're just so heated at the moment that you're not thinking, hey, this could end in a collision rather than a than a put out. And so they, they both are sprinting full speed. I think at the very end, Walker realizes what's about to happen. So instead of just barreling directly into Carlson, he starts to, he hits the deck and he rolls. And, you know, Carlson has limited vision on what Walker's doing, I'm sure, because he's trying, trying to track the the fly ball and Carlson ass over tea kettle ends up having a sprained AC joint in his left shoulder. You saw the collision by now. I'm sure um, I retweeted it on Twitter and I did. I said, Jordan, my man, cause that was my reaction is like, goodness. I know that it's not necessarily anybody's fault, but Jordan Walker is the size that he is. And so if you collide with Jordan Walker, it's not going to be pretty. And so I do think that's an element of Walker's game in right field that he, you know, with more experience, hopefully can get a handle on. But that is one that makes you go, is it worth it to have him in right field long term? Um, again, this is a rare type of play. It's the exact type of play that it would have needed to be to get the guy injured. And that's unfortunate. Um, I, I'm not trying to ride Jordan Walker too hard because, again, he said, look, I wasn't called off. And and I believe that he wasn't called off, you know, and he said, if, if Carlson called me off and I didn't hear it, I apologize. But I would bet that Carlson didn't call him off. And I haven't seen quotes from Dylan yet. But if I had to guess, Dylan was thinking the same thing I was thinking watching it, which is he's he's thinking, I'm not going to get to the ball. So how do I call off the other guy, right? Like he doesn't know exactly where he's going to be. Maybe more veteran experience in center field for Dylan would would lead to having that instinct of, of maybe how to patrol that situation. Um, I'm not even sure that's necessarily fair. I, I do think, though, you'd like to see the center fielder say something, have some sort of communication it's tough in the moment, though. It really probably is a tough play in the moment. It's unfortunate all around. Um, like I said, I put the tweet out where I just said, Jordan, my man, because I'm just thinking a guy of that size, you you really, if you're, if you're barreling full speed. 
But I think to his credit, again, he I think the reason he falls down and hits the deck is to try to mitigate any damage he's going to do to Carlson. But at that point, the damage was going to be done. Um, super unfortunate. I don't want to hash out any more about that because I think either way, the result is just it's a bummer that Dylan's going to be on the IL. Um, but I do think it's one of those things that even if it's not the fault of Jordan Walker, you look at that play and you go, long term, what's the upside of having him in right field? I think for the roster, it would make so much sense for it to work. Um, and look, he's made some diving catches. I, I saw, uh, I think it was Sunday, maybe I was watching. He made a diving catch in right field where I think he probably dropped the ball being honest, but his, his butt was to the home plate side and he was kind of shielding the ball with his body. And it seemed like he took a second to kind of get up and show it to the umpires because I think it was, maybe he was scooping it back into his glove. I don't know. I, I would love to get the answer on that, but I don't know if I don't know if it's there's ever a right time to ask Jordan Walker, hey, remember that play in spring? Did you really catch that ball? Maybe off the record. I think it would be interesting to know because I just don't think there are any outfield cameras that would have gotten the angle. And so in a spring game anyway, you're probably not going to bother reviewing it. But I my gut was that he didn't catch that ball. But I, I bring up the play to say it was an athletic diving attempt and and rule the catch, regardless of whether he actually had it or just was able to sell that he had it. Um he can make some athletic plays out there. He is a good athlete. He is growing in terms of being able to to patrol right field and handle the, the position. His arm is certainly a, a plus out there if he can corral it. The strength of the arm is is fantastic, and hoping that he can kind of uh, hone that in to be able to to have accurate throws to the bases, um, throwing into second, to home, and to third base as well at times. You know, those are things that you want to see from Jordan Walker. It would fit the roster really well to be able to to get average or better defensive performance from him in right and the bat that goes with it rather than just having to say oh he's got to be relegated to dh or, or first base if that's a possibility um it's not that he's a bad fielder again he just hasn't done it for that long in the outfield but that being said like tommy edmund you know different kind of athlete he didn't do it and then he was great when he first started so it is one of those things that the cardinals i think will have to think about long term um, but but my take on that is you give Jordan Walker some run. You have to, obviously, with the way the team is constructed this year. But give him some run in right field and, and give him a chance to show what he can do. It's just those kind of plays. Maybe they need to have a little bit more of a conversation about it. It's like even in a regular season game, uh, we'll give up the double rather than potentially risk. Like we've got to have a little bit more awareness of of where each other is, even though it's not a perfect situation. And I, and I fully acknowledge it would be difficult uh, to get right, but somebody's got to be able to duck out there, and typically it's probably going to be the right fielder um, that does so. But again, I think d- people will watch that play, and and different folks will have different interpretations, and some people will say, "Oh, you know, I grew up around baseball, and Dylan should have done this, or or Jordan should have done this." Either way, it sucks because the outcome is that Carlson's on the IL. Um, I saw the tweet from Derek Gould where Mosellac said they're they're thinking this will be measured in in weeks rather than in terms of months for the absence for Carlson, but. Weeks can still mean six or seven, right? You can, that's a, that's a nice kind of way to massage the phrasing so that it sounds like it's not as bad as it is. Um, AC joint sprain is what we're talking about in the left shoulder for Dylan Carlson. Quick Google search tells me there are different grades of a sprain that you can have. And the, the kind of low grade would be 10 to 14 day recovery. Whereas on the high end, a grade three separation may take six to eight weeks to recover from it. Again, anytime you Google those things, it's going to tell you probably for the standard human these athletes are not standard humans, and so you could hope that they um, might be able to make it back quicker. But Mosellock says, quote, not a matter of months in terms of his recovery and, and return to the team, which is uh, the report from Derek Gould there on Twitter. I see also on Derek's timeline that Victor Scott will wear uh, or is wearing out in Arizona number 11. So that was a deal where the Cardinals got the testing done on Carlson, I'm sure, on Monday after the game. Saw, so, yep, this isn't going to be something that's resolved in, in a couple of days. And so let's get Victor on a plane and out there to Arizona, where he has evidently already joined the team as of this recording on Tuesday afternoon. So that's the news. Victor Scott the second will be in center field for the Cardinals to begin the year. And I think it is uh, clearly the right choice. Um, I would have had Victor Scott on this team even before the Carlson injury. I hadn't done, obviously, a podcast in, in uh, recent days to be able to kind of update you guys on my thoughts, unless you were following me at for 12 on Twitter. You maybe didn't have the most updated thoughts that I had, but my my sort of commentary, and we talked about this on KTGR Big Show as well. You can listen to the big show, KTGR.com, weekdays from 4 to 6. We talk Cardinals, we talk Mizzou, we talk uh, Kansas City Chiefs, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, just general sports talk in mid-Missouri. But we were kind of breaking down our thoughts on whether or not Victor Scott should or would make the team. And I said, I don't think he will, but I'd have him on there and I'd have him in center 
and I would have Dylan Carlson uh, with the great spring that he that he ultimately ended up having uh, right to the end was was hitting a lot better against right-handed pitching. Had a couple of home runs, I believe, against righties. I think he led the team in home runs in general this spring. Had an OPS above 800, which is uh, a notable mark considering that he started pretty slow to begin the spring and really came on strong and was showing some good things from both sides of the plate. So that's what you really would have looked to see if you're the Cardinals. And I did say all the way along, it, the only way Scott doesn't make this team with the way that he was performing in spring, which his numbers kind of trailed off a little bit. And you do worry that it could it be smoke and mirrors the batting average because he's just doing it in, in a very Magnera Sierra sort of way where he's getting on base because of his speed rather than because of the the contact that he's uh, that he's generating. That's something that we're going to obviously find out over the course of the, the next few weeks when when Victor Scott does get his his chance to land here with the Cardinals. But as I was alluding to, the only way that I saw that Victor Scott wasn't going to make the team was if Dylan Carlson went berserk and had a really strong finish to the spring, thus making the Cardinals go, yeah, he needs to be our everyday center fielder. We need to give him this opportunity because we've sort of buried him in the past. And if he's taking it by the horns and and seizing the opportunity, when we also have guys like Edmund and Newpar not healthy, it would be a really bad look and a, a pretty significant confidence killer if you then tell Carlson, hey, we like it, but you're still the fourth outfielder because we're going to play this Victor Scott's Victor Scott kid, see what he has. Like that would not have that would not have gone over well. And you may not care about the feelings of the players, but I do think the interpersonal side, that the best organizations manage those things and, and do so effectively and fairly. Uh and, and you could have made the case that, hey, Victor Scott, if he doesn't have everyday playing time in, in the majors, then you know, it's not worth bringing him up because he needs to be getting at bats and getting reps and improving on his skill set as a twenty three year old player who hasn't yet seen AAA. So the Cardinals saw Carlson have that type of spring at the end of the day, and they said, yep, he's going to be the everyday guy. Now, what I would have done is put Scott in center, Dylan in left, because you can still reward that. And yes, it would have made things a little bit more difficult to figure out, well, where does Brennan Donovan play versus is he the DH? Is is Gorman going to DH some? How about Alec Burleson? Burley would have probably been the odd man out most days uh, against right-handed pitching, which, you know, is unfortunate because he has a 950 OPS and that's just the way I saw it though. I thought it was time to give Dylan Carlson a shot. Uh, even though Burleson has played well, it seemed to me that, that Carlson, whether it's just like the leg up because the veteranship, whatever you would call it, I was ready to give Carlson that shot, but in left and let Victor roam center because I thought defensively that gave you the chance to be as good as you can possibly be with Dylan in left, who's a good outfielder. And so you put him in left field, put Victor in center, have that range there and be able to kind of guide a long Jordan Walker in right where you expect his range to not be, um, you know, quite as strong. That's ultimately the decision that I would have made prior to the Carlson injury. It's not the, the decision the Cardinals were going to make because they had Victor Scott obviously uh, sent to the minors camp, which would have set up a scenario for the opening day lineup to see uh, Carlson in center, obviously Jordan in right, and then left would have been either Brendan Donovan or Alec Burleson, with conceivably the other one serving as the DH, or maybe if if it's Burleson and left, you go Donovan at second, Gorman at DH. The the triangle has always been in my head left, second, and uh, the designated hitter. Those are the three spots that uh, really you can align anyway with the group of players that you have, and one of them is going to be on your bench. The wrinkle in that is the fact that Matt Carpenter has had a really strong spring, and on Sunday, I believe, the final day of Grapefruit League, you saw the lineup from Ali Marmel that basically resembled what I think you're going to see on Thursday or would have seen if not for the Carlson injury, which had Matt Carpenter actually in the DH spot with Brandon Donovan playing left. Now I don't really know what it's going to look like. If I had to guess, you're going to see Victor in center, Donovan in left, and then it'll either be Carpenter or Burleson in the DH spot. I think it might be Carpenter based on what we saw Sunday. I would have assumed it would be Carpenter for the home opener, And I know what you're all saying is like, well, wait a minute. You said Carpenter was going to be a halftime, part-time, no-time player when the Cardinals signed him months ago. Yeah, everybody kind of thought that would be the case, but they also didn't think that the Cardinals would not get Edmund back, lose Lars Newpar to injury, and lose Dylan Carlson to injury. Like, inevitably, the injuries have kind of changed the math on that a little bit to where there is kind of room to allow for Matt Carpenter to to take the DH slot against right-handed pitching on some of these days. And could it just be a case of like opening day, home opener, those sort of ceremonial things? Another reason to put Carpenter there above maybe a Burleson who's a, a second year player, that sort of thing. And it's not even, you know, necessarily a, a, a diss on Burleson's performance. Carpenter's just been better. I mean, Carpenter has an OPS above a thousand this spring, not as many at bats or opportunities, 
uh, for a veteran player that just doesn't stay into games as, quite as long. And Carpenter did deal with uh, some nagging injuries here and there throughout camp. But Burleson's had a great spring, too, an OPS around 940, and he's going to get opportunities, but it wouldn't surprise me based on what we saw Sunday if it ends up being Carpenter as the DH with Burleson as a potential threat off the bench. And it's at Dodger Stadium. Uh, some success there, if you were a call for Matt Carpenter in the past. Uh, he won't get to face Clayton Kershaw in this one, but um, nevertheless, it, it probably will be Carpenter and certainly will be Carpenter, I think, uh, on April 4th in St. Louis when the Cardinals take on the Marlins for the home opener uh, a week after the the actual season begins for the Cards. What do we think about the news? What do we think about the decision that the Cardinals have made to go ahead and give Victor Scott this opportunity? Let me know in the YouTube comment section below your thoughts and anything else that you would like to see covered or see talked about when it comes to this team heading into the season. Because once we get to the season, the storylines of the offseason and of spring training are going to be in the rearview mirror, and we'll finally be able to talk about real honest-to-goodness baseball, break it down, talk about this team and where we think they're going to land. I think I could end up doing one more podcast before Thursday. Maybe this is one I'll put up Wednesday, talking about my thoughts and, and a, a season prediction and a win total prediction and how I arrived at those uh, at those numbers. If you want a sneak preview of some of that, you can check out uh, Charlie Marla's YouTube channel or just on the B-Shape Daily podcast feed, the low-hanging fruit episode that Charlie and I recorded earlier Tuesday. Mind you, before the Dylan Carlson information was finalized and, and publicized by the Cardinals. So you won't really get any updated Dylan stuff there. You just got that from me here. But you can check that out, Low Hanging Fruit, Episode 10, talking about our season predictions and uh, where I landed in terms of a win total. And if you don't want to listen to that, you can stay tuned to this YouTube channel, and I'll probably do that video tomorrow, the day before the regular season. I'm also doing the polls on Twitter as it pertains to Cardinal win totals. This is something I've done for the past, I don't know, five or six years and I start down real low, and then I say over under how many cardinal how many wins for the Cardinals, and I keep raising the number with each subsequent poll until at least fifty percent of y'all vote under the number, and then that's essentially what Cardinals Twitter agrees will be the win total. And then previous years, y'all have done a really nice job. Last year, it was a complete abject disaster because I think everybody said oh, 91, 92 wins before the poll stopped, which is why I always go back and say you didn't know, at least if you're a Twitter user and you're you didn't know for sure that the Cardinals were going to be as bad as they ended up being. Nobody actually knew that. Everybody wants to play revisionist history and said, oh, I saw it coming. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Because the, the majority of you absolutely did not. Because everybody said the Cardinals were pretty comfortably going to win 90-plus games last year, and they instead lost 91 games last year. But I do think that's always an interesting exercise. And uh, I think I'm up to 79 and a half as of right now. Uh, you can go vote on Twitter at my uh, Twitter handle, at bshafer12 and let it be known uh, what you think. Do the Cardinals get to at least 80 wins? I think that's probably going to clear, but we may not be doing the poll for very many more uh, very many more days. Obviously, with Thursday, the season's going to start. I hope to be done by then, but I'll if it's looking like it's tracking toward uh, still hitting the over, I'll keep pushing the polls out, but it does seem like we're going to be a little bit more pessimistic than these polls have been in most years, but that's understandable given the team is coming off a 91-loss season, and everybody's kind of looking at it wondering, whether or not this team's actually going to be any better than it was last year, especially when you look at some of the, the spring performances for guys like Goldschmidt and Arenado, you go, well, if you don't have those guys, what do you have in terms of this offense being a stabilizing force, and will the pitching be any better? So we'll dive into that a little bit more tomorrow, but I want to wrap up by just kind of reiterating my thoughts on, on Victor Scott. This is the right move. The Cardinals, I know they maybe thought, hey, get him some more seasoning. I honestly don't know how much they're concerned about him being ready, and I've seen a lot of commentary about, well, they, they could spoil his development if they bring him up too soon, and I guess that's true, but again, I it's not something I worry about uh, because I don't think it's something that we are like adept at being able to project anyway, and there can be a player that's had all the minor league time in the world, and he comes up, and it turns out he wasn't ready, and you spoiled his development, but how could you have known because he said, well, look, we gave him all this time in the minors, and like it's just not one of those things that I think is is very tangible or or you're able to tangibly ascertain beforehand. It's always easy to look back and say, here's where this guy's development was spoiled. Here's where it didn't matter for this guy. Here's where it didn't matter for that guy. Like, I don't really think in the moment we can know. So you can always have your approach be, oh, I'm always worried about every guy's development. Or it's like, eh, they played baseball their whole lives, and now they're going to play baseball at a different level than they've played it before. And we'll get to see what it looks like. And if it looks bad, inevitably, they're going to get one of these outfielders back within the next few weeks, right? Whether it's Newt Barr, Tommy Edmond may be a little bit longer. Carlson, I'm guessing, is going to be probably at least three weeks, but I guess we're going to have to see 
what the word is on that and how his uh, progression goes. But by mid to late April, you're hoping to at least get one of those guys back. And even if it does end up being Lars Newpar, you probably do end up at that point just kind of about phase. You didn't want to put him in center, but you didn't want to have three center fielders get injured, did you? So Newpar goes to center to sort of stabilize things until Edmund or Carlson gets back or until Victor Scott says, yeah, this is my job and nobody's taking it from me. Like, that is a possible outcome of this. It's not maybe the most likely outcome just because it is a jump from double-A to major leagues and it's going to be interesting to see kind of how the Cardinals grade what Victor Scott does. Like, what if his OPS is 650? Well, that'd be a little bit below average, but he's also going to be batting ninth, which I'm almost certain he's going to be batting ninth. It's either going to be eighth or ninth. They're not going to lead him off. I would be shocked if they let him off. So you're going to be looking at a guy at the back end of your lineup but the main thing that's that's really been the driving force, I think, behind this decision is he's going to stabilize center field in the way that Tommy Edmond was supposed to, but maybe even better because he's going to have the same type of speed and probably better speed and range and athleticism as Edmond, but he's got more instincts for the outfield just because he's done it more. And he presumably has a stronger throwing arm than Edmond because that was maybe the one knock on Tommy Edmond as a center fielder. I think Victor Scott can stabilize the outfield, which is uh, it's extremely important for this Cardinals team because of the way, and I've, I've beat this horse all off season long. It's so dead now that I don't know why I'm still talking about it. But the reason is I don't feel like this has been as big of a topic of conversation outside of, you know, just doing this podcast. People have talked about it for sure. And I've, I've asked the Cardinals about it and the Cardinals have been asked by other people about it, but I don't know if I, it's kind of feels like one of those that a lot of people treat it like, eh, yeah, defense is important. That's, that's great. That's a nice talking point. But no, I really think it could make the difference for the Cardinals this season, so that's why I continue to bring it up. And when the Cardinals said we want Tommy Edmond to be able to focus on center field and not have to switch to being a backup shortstop at any point in time, I said, oh, maybe they're taking this thing seriously. But then the offseason went and spring began, and it was like, you actually haven't built a roster that's going to allow for that. And then when they ended up getting uh, Brandon Crawford, it's like, okay, he can be that. Whether he was uh, an obvious and good answer to be the backup to Mason Wynn, whether he still has gas in the tank, like we're going to find out. But at least at that point, they had a game plan of like, yes, we've been saying it would be nice to have Tommy be able to focus on center. And then we've built a roster now that allows for that. Um, my personal take at the time and still is, it's like, how bad could Thomas to JC really be at shortstop? I think you could, you could put him there if you really had to, but they also don't want Thomas to JC on the bench. They want him getting everyday playing time in the same way that they wanted it for Victor Scott. So, I don't think even if there's an injury to Brandon Crawford, which I know he's been a little banged up, I don't know how much sense it would make to put JC on the roster instead and have him be sort of the reserve where he's just backing up Mason Wynn, backing up some of the other infielders uh, where there's really not a need for that because you already have Gorman and Donovan that can both play second and third. So you just really don't have a lot of room to play with there in terms of playing time for a backup shortstop, which to me, if Brandon Crawford's not ready for whatever reason, that would be Jose Fermin's opportunity. And Fermin has hit the cover off the ball, has done a really nice job at the plate this spring. I don't know how much that's ultimately going to translate. And I don't know that he's ideal in terms of his arm strength and his ability at shortstop, but I think it's probably in a pinch uh, good enough if it ends up being that Brandon Crawford is not ready to go to back up Mason Wynn. Like, unless you end up with genuine playing time to offer Thomas to JC, I don't think you want to put him on the team just yet. But I've liked offensively what we've seen from him. And I've seen them put him at shortstop a number of times to where I feel like, is it is he going to be like a gold glove shortstop? Probably not. But again, you're talking about somebody off the bench just to handle the spot. It's largely going to be Mason Wynn's position. And, you know, that's going to be another topic of conversation tomorrow when we say, how many games does this team actually win it's going to depend on guys like Mason Wynn and what they actually do. And and he hasn't necessarily had the strongest of springs offensively either. But I really do think defensively, it makes sense to bring Victor Scott along. Even if you're a little bit worried about, well, is he going to hit much? That's not the end of the world to me because I, I think what he can bring, as long as he doesn't bring his struggles to the field, should he struggle at the plate, he ends up giving you, especially at the Dodger Stadium outfield, giving you the stabilization of center field that can help a Miles Michaelis who pitches to contact. That can help a Kyle Gibson who pitches to contact. Um, Lance Lynn gives up a fair bit of contact, right? Like that's 60% of your rotation that we're talking about. And, and Steven Matz is not going to strike out 12 per nine. So he's going to have his his contact that that you're going to, as a fielder, need to be able to back him up. Um, you know, Sonny Gray, when he gets out there, hopefully strikes guys out. But you're going to have Zach Thompson, a young pitcher, trying to make his way. You want the best defense possible behind guys like that uh, to boost confidence and to just generally have good team morale about 
being able to understand the process of what y'all are trying to do. You're trying to maximize defense in order to prevent runs and, and give your pitchers easier times out there. I just don't think that if you had said, eh, well, we're going to get new bar back soon or yeah, Dylan won't be out for that long. So we're going to go, you know, Michael Siani's going to play a lot of center and he's good enough in, in, in center defensively, which I'm not saying he's a bad fielder. I don't project him to be much of a hitter at the big league level. And maybe that's just unfair to him. He doesn't have as much of a prospect pedigree. And so it'll be harder for him to prove it. It's kind of like a Richie Palacios. You know, he happened into the opportunity and he, and he proved over a length of time that he could play a little bit. The Rays valued that. And now they're potentially going to end up using him after the trade with the Cardinals. Um, but until a guy like that gets the opportunity, like a Siani, I think Siani's in a similar spot um, and, and then proves it within that opportunity, which is sometimes hard to come by. He's just kind of placed into a, a bucket mentally of like, yeah, that's a guy that, you know, you don't mind being on your bench. You're not worried about him losing out on opportunities um, to grow his game by playing every day in the minors. And for Siani, you want to be in the big leagues. At this point, you've 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 grinded enough. It's like, I'll be an outfielder that doesn't play if I'm making that big league money. So I don't think anybody minds that. But for the Cardinals to say, we'll put him in center field every day, we'll have, you know, Donovan play left, and Burleson can, can DH, um, and then probably have to find another outfielder I don't even know who they would have gone to in terms of down the line. Um, it, pro- it could have been another 40-man move. I'm not even familiar with who's on the roster. It wouldn't have been anybody that they were exuberant about, yeah, we're going to get him into the lineup every day. No, Victor Scott was the obvious guy. Even if it's for three weeks, and then you have to make a roster move to send him back if he's struggling, then he, he struggles a little bit, and he knows what to work on, and he goes back and works on it in AAA the same way that Jordan Walker did. Nobody is crying that the Cardinals killed Jordan Walker's development last year by what they did. I think they handled it a little bit silly, but ultimately it's it's a bump in the road and I don't think it's going to hinder him in, in his career in any, any major way. In fact, we already saw him come back from AAA last year and and do really well at the plate. So I, I just don't think that that is an argument that holds water that, oh, his development is going to be tarnished forever. It might be, but it could have been regardless. He could play a full year in AAA and then come up and still not be ready. It's going to be catered to each person and we're not ever really going to know until we've already seen it play out. So it's hard to predict that. And if I were going to make an attempt to predict whether one guy versus another is going to have his career negatively impacted by maybe prematurely being brought to the big leagues, I would look at the guy's makeup, mental makeup, uh, and I think Victor Scott is aces in that regard. Uh, all we've heard about him is is the background that he comes from, very grounded in uh, the, the way that he approaches the game and hungry to learn and improve. So I don't feel like this is a guy that's going to lose confidence all of a sudden if he goes for... You know, he goes one for 12 in his opening series in Los Angeles. And then for the rest of his career, he's he's second guessing himself. I just personally don't subscribe to that. I respect if you do. It's just not something that I see as being uh, all too big of a concern, uh, particularly with this player. So we'll end up seeing whether that comes to fruition for Victor Scott, that he's able to sort of upend the the, the notion that, hey, an early call up here could could kind of wreck his development. We'll see how he ends up handling the pressure. I think he's a guy who's ready for the pressure, and that doesn't mean he's going to come out and and be leadoff caliber and have an 800 OPS or even a 750 OPS. Uh, Remember, like you're talking about guys like Dylan Carlson, Tommy Eben, who lifetime are 7-0 something in terms of OPS, league average offensively type of players uh, over the course of their career. If Victor Scott gives you 700 OPS, we're doing backflips because that means that he's holding his own offensively and he's giving you hopefully gold glove caliber center field play. I, I I don't want to project that automatically. He's going to go to the bigs and be great, but you know, defense travels. I think that's something that uh, as long as he stays within himself and doesn't try to do anything different than what got him to this point defensively, he's going to be a plus for the Cardinals in terms of his range and ability in center field. And he's fun. Like that's the bottom line too. He is fun. He's exuberant. He's energetic. He's got speed athleticism to burn. Like that can have a, a, earth-shattering effect on a team. The more of those types of guys that you have that can make big-time plays and can energize the clubhouse, Victor Scott brings that. So to me, it was a no-brainer. Um, I saw some people who say, oh, I really hope the Cardinals don't now make a decision where they you know, they rush him along after the Carlson injury. Um, there was no other decision to be made, respectfully. I just don't... It, it was never a case where it would make sense not to have him. Even if it's just a number of weeks, that's weeks where he can play every day and, and get that learning experience. And hey, let's say he's Michael Harris which is is not a fair kind of, you know, label to put on a guy, but let's say he's Michael Harris and he comes up and he's just good and and can play. Okay, then he's here for for, you know, the rest of the way. Tommy Edmond is going to be something else. He's going to be the backup shortstop. 
Brandon Crawford may not be long for the team. Like you can start making those those moves happen in your head if Victor Scott is that dude. I'm not saying he's going to be that dude. If I had to guess, he's going to be more like a you know 660, 670, 680 OPS. But I think that's enough to hold his own. 95 OPS plus Sterling center fielder, uh, batting eighth or ninth. You can live with that. You don't necessarily need too many of those types of guys on your team. But he's basically got a chance to be sort of a, a speedier version of what Tommy Edmund was going to be to this lineup, right? Tommy Edmonds' OPS was around 700. Dylan's was around 700. Ideally, Dylan will develop into more power for his game. And ideally, Tommy, when fully healthy, is going to be a better hitter too, right? The risk was something that hampered him last year. But I just don't view it as this big detriment to say, oh, if, if you know, if he struggles offensively, if Victor Scott doesn't have a, a robust start offensively, it's a doomed experiment. I don't see it that way. I think stabilizing center field is that important to the pitching staff, even if Victor Scott gives you basically nothing from the nine hole, uh, which he's not going to give you nothing. His speed is going to earn him base hits. That it, it might be a little bit smoke and mirrors. Like I mentioned, Magnera Sierra. I think the upside for this player is far beyond what Magnera Sierra ever accomplished. But I also don't think it's the end of the world if the Cardinals just say, hey, means to an end right now. This guy can flat out ball in center field, and we need to back up our pitching staff that's been a little bit you know, troublesome with their ERAs in spring in terms of some of the stars like Lynn and Gibson. We we need to be able to back these guys up to the best of our organizational abilities, and that is Victor Scott. And let's let's see what a kid with some confidence does with that opportunity batting, probably low in the order. But let's see if he can he can just maybe be the full package right away, and we don't ever have to look back. Um, that's the perfect world of the way this could go, and there's always a range of outcomes. But let me know what you think is going to happen when it comes to Victor Scott, Cardinals opening day center fielder, on Thursday in Los Angeles. I'm excited to see what it looks like. Um, Carl, he's going to get some run. Victor Scott's going to get some run after the injury to Dylan Carlson. So let me know in the YouTube comment section below what you think, and make sure to hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Lower right-hand corner of your video, you'll be able to easily subscribe to the Brendan Schaefer St. Louis Cardinals writer YouTube channel, where we'll have Cardinals content all season long. It's getting up and going now with the season just a couple of days away. Thank you guys so much for listening. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. We will talk to you next time on Be Shaved Daily. Peace.